Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, Karen Litzy, and in today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Neil Pearson. Neil is a physiotherapist and clinical assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. He is a yoga teacher, a yoga therapist, and creator of the Pain Care Yoga Training Programs for Health Professionals and Yoga Therapists. Neil is a founding chair of the Physiotherapy Pain Science Division in Canada recipient of the Canadian Pain Society's Excellence in Interprofessional Pain Education Award, faculty in yoga therapist training programs, and an author. Neil develops innovative resources, collaborates in research, and serves as a mentor for health professionals and yoga practitioners seeking to enhance their therapeutic expertise. He is co-editor of the Yoga and Science in Pain Care Treating the Person in Pain. This is a book. It is available now wherever books are sold. And if you want a copy of the book, and we talk about it during this interview, you can just go to podcast.healthywealthysmart.com, and we have Yoga and Science in Pain Care, Treating the Person in Pain. Click on that. It'll take you right to uh, where you can buy the book, which is great. So what we talk about in today's episode is the components of yoga practice that benefit people with persistent pain, yoga therapy as a pain education agent, the Panchamaya Kosha, and I hope I said that right, model of yoga and the biopsychosocial model of healthcare, and of course, their new book, Yoga and Science in Pain Care, Treating the Person in Pain. So you guys, if you've not had the chance to see Neil teach live, I highly suggest you do that. Look up his resources. He's just wonderful. Uh, If you are interested in becoming a yoga therapist, reach out to him. He can help you with that as well. Uh, So everyone, please enjoy today's episode. And again, a huge thank you to Neil for taking the time out and coming on the podcast. Hey, Neil, welcome to the podcast. I'm happy to have you on to talk about yoga and Science in Pain Care, which is the title of uh, your new book, and we will talk about the book throughout the podcast, but I'm excited to learn more about yoga and how yoga can work with people in pain. So welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much, Karen. I I can't remember how long it's been since we've been here, but it's uh, wonderful to be back. Yeah, I think it's been a while. I don't know either, but I think it's been a long time. But I'm excited today to talk about yoga and how yoga can uh, be an agent for people in pain. So as a lot of the listeners know, I had a long history of uh, chronic neck pain. So this is something that really interests Mm -hmm. me, but I will kind of pass it along to you. So how does yoga help as a pain education agent? Okay. So um, maybe I'll start at a bit of a different place, but come to there. So I guess part of my excitement around this, you know, we've got this new textbook out about um, it's called yoga and, and science and pain care. And really what it's trying to do is, is teach, healthcare people about um, yoga and yoga uh, research and how it can help and uh, sort of how it can help, but also some of the research behind it in terms of why it would work. Um, And also it's sort of try to go the other way as well is to teach yoga people about, uh, about pain and about the lived experience of pain. So with the textbook, we're trying to hit both sides, right? Mm -hmm. Because we really see this as being something that needs to be integrated and I think we sort of hit a really nice time with this because there's such interest in non-pharmacological pain management now, Um, you know, because, uh, you know, everyone's starting to recognize that the, the long-term management of pain or the care of people in pain has a lot to do with what, what the individual does for themselves. Um, Not completely as self-help kind of work, but more as what the person does for themselves under the guidance of people like us as physical therapists and uh, under the guidance of people like yoga therapists. 
So that's sort of the, the, the sort of broader um, where this is coming from. And then if we look at sort of how it can help, um, we can start by looking at some of the research and I guess probably in terms of pain management and pain care, uh, the simple thing to do to start with would be to say we have now have four uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews that show that um, yoga therapy has been shown to be effective at helping people to have less pain, to improve both um, uh, perception of ability, but also measured function, um, and also improved quality of life. And those three things really are the, the three keys that people want when we have ongoing pain. We want to have less pain, better ease of movement, and better quality of life. And, of course. And the research is showing positive findings there. Um, and it's, it's showing positive findings in quite a varied uh, group. So um, there's a lot of research on low back pain. I mean, that's the one where, that has the most research, so much so that the, you know, the American Medical Association now has uh, yoga as one of the uh, suggested treatments for people who have ongoing low back pain. But it also shows benefits for people who have rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, whiplash-associated disorder, um, and uh, irritable bowel syndrome as well. So there's this, there's this growing body of evidence saying that when people have these conditions, that uh, they can find benefit from them. And of course, like any area of research, we'd have to say, you know, the, the research doesn't say that it's going to work for everyone. It just says that if you take a lot of people and you give it to them, uh, there will be some benefit with, with uh, using yoga as the therapy. Uh, people always want to know, well, is the yoga therapy better than physical therapy or is it better than going to the gym? Is it better for other movement practices? And we don't have that research yet. Um, the, uh, the effect sizes of um, some of the research when people are going through using yoga therapy for pain management um, are higher than the effect sizes of movement on their own mm -hmm. um, and comparable to the effect sizes you see when you do research looking at cognitive behavioral therapy plus movement therapy for people with chronic pain, which makes a lot of sense because uh, yoga therapy really does cover a lot of the aspects of the person. And so your listeners may be thinking yoga for people with pain. That sounds actually pretty ridiculous because whenever I see pictures of people doing yoga, there's no way that that's what people in pain are going to do. Right, because they're always yeah. in these positions where even if I don't have pain, I think to myself, how <laughs> in the heck am I supposed to get into that position? Well, exactly, right? And, and it's sort of um, the, the other question that often sounds ridiculous is uh, to the person who has ongoing pain is, like, aren't you listening to me? I told you that movement hurts and you're telling me you want me to move as a way to get better. But movement is the problem. And so it's interesting that uh, yoga, the practices of yoga can help people to find uh, ways, new ways to move with more ease, but also um, the practice of yoga we need to recognize uh, really are so vast. Uh, we're talking about, um, if we sort of overviewed yoga, yoga is about uh, learning how to relate to yourself in new ways how to live in the world in new ways. It is about movement with the postures and it is about doing breathing techniques. And then there are awareness techniques, um, which are akin to mindfulness, but they're a little bit different. Um, and then there are also within yoga, there are meditation techniques as well. So it really covers a broad, mm -hmm. broad spectrum of interventions. And if we go to the literature again around chronic pain and chronic pain care, we see that uh, mindfulness techniques and meditation are showing mm -hmm. positive benefits. Movement is showing positive benefits. Um, gaining knowledge is showing positive benefits. Um, accept, acceptance, commitment therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, all these things show benefit for people with chronic pain. And there are aspects of those all within yoga sort of as this package. And the idea would be that we could, with the person who has ongoing pain, the yoga therapist would be able to do an assessment to see how the pain has uh, changed the person or influenced sort of all the aspects of their existence, and then try to find how we could could use different techniques of yoga to help. So, for instance, if a person was um, 
let's take a common example, like a person who has chronic back pain, mm -hmm. but we know that with chronic back pain, often there's uh, anxiety, often there's grief. Well, there are aspects of yoga that we could use to address the, the, the grief or the anxiety. Um, often when we have ongoing pain, we have the sense of uh, loss of self-confidence or self-efficacy, and mm -hmm. we could use certain aspects of yoga to address those. Uh, our body tends to get stiff or, or some muscles, uh, you know, are just gripping all the time. And within yoga, we can do things to help to release muscles that are gripping or learn how to re-engage muscles that seem to be inhibited. And so it's a, the practice of, of yoga would be to, uh, or yoga therapy would be to go through it and see how this individual is impacted and then see how we could use the, the different aspects uh, within yoga to put together a plan to, to, uh, address a lot of the, 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 the changes that are related to ongoing pain. Yeah, so I think it's, it's what you're describing may be a little different than what a lot of perhaps the listeners are seeing, meaning yoga is more than just handstands on Instagram <laughs> and you know doing these impossible moves and making them look so easy because I think that's what a lot of people associate yoga with. Oh, exactly. Right? And so what we're talking about here is not just going to a yoga class or not just putting something fun up on Instagram, but the yoga therapist being very intentional in their uh, prescription for the type of yoga therapy they feel this person needs. So it's individualized based on a proper evaluation. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And, and although the one difference in yoga therapy is that yoga therapy is not diagnostic, right? So the, the yoga therapist isn't a trained healthcare professional. Um, and so what the yoga therapist is, is doing is, is actually applying yoga, getting the person to do different aspects of yoga, like meditation or awareness mm -hmm. or breathing or movement, and then seeing how the person is limited in that, and then working with them to find a way so that they can do that particular particular technique to help them to uh, uh, change ease of movement, quality of life, pain. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, something we, we spoke about this a little bit before we went on the air, but there was a sentence within the book, the yoga and science and pain care that uh, I had never heard of this saying before. I mean, I'm not immersed in the yoga world, but it's uh, the sentence is expanding our view and even altering our perspective to a panchamaya kosha perspective enhances our understanding that pain physiology is studying the person as much as our biology. So can you talk about that for a little bit? Because I kind of like that <laughs> saying. So you right. can expand on that. Yeah, so there's sort of the two parts of it is that, that studying uh, physiology is about studying the person, not just the biology. But then there's also this panchamaya kosha, which I'll, I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. within, within healthcare, we talk about the biopsychosocial or biopsychosocial mm -hmm. spiritual model, which is intended to be an, an integrated view of the person that uh, everything biological is going to affect everything psychological is going to affect everything social is going to affect the person in a spiritual manner. And it's all working together as an integrated unit. Um, so within yoga, the, the philosophy and the, the view of yoga is that um, there are different aspects of the individual. So the individual is integrated and whole, but we can look at the in individual from different aspects to understand them better. And so um, this Panchamaya Kosha view looks at um, the individual from a, a physical perspective, from a more energetic perspective, mm -hmm. um, pr being prana uh, is one of the things they're talking about, which really is life force. Um, and then it really relates a lot to breath as well. But then there's the, within yoga, to simplify, we could say we look at the they often call it the lower mind, but it's really getting at the automatic aspects of the human, all that stuff that runs automatically. Mm -hmm. And then there's above that, or, uh, you know, I guess you could say above it, there's this other aspect of us that it's about us thinking about what we're thinking. And it's about us uh, regulating thoughts and emotions and breath and all that stuff. And then, and then the, the, other aspect of us is more the aspect of us that has more to do with spirit and connectedness to to the world and, and everything and so 
yoga already looks at the person from that kind of perspective and with the idea that um, any change in one aspect of the individual is going to have an effect on the other aspects of the individual. So if you have low back pain, it's going to change the way you breathe. It's going to change the automatic functioning of the body. It's going to change the way you think and emote, and it will change your connection with yourself, your community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but then yoga also has as part of its core belief system is that um, if a person had low back pain, you could help the person with low back pain by going through any one of those aspects of the person so that you could help the person by affecting the physical body, the, 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 by working on breath, by working on the automatic system, by working on thoughts and emotions or community that all those, everything interacts. And so that you could, you know, work at it, uh, through any of those aspects of your existence. Got it. And as someone who had had chronic neck pain for many years, it is very true that the physical pain certainly affects so much else that is happening in your life. It affects your mm -hmm. thoughts. It affects your emotions. It affects your relationships. It affects the way you hold your body, the way you relate to your body, the way you see your body. So mm -hmm. I, now I feel like I have a much better idea as to what that sentence means and how yoga can help the individual relate to all of that and kind of put it all together. Cause sometimes when you're in it, you don't see it. Oh, exactly. You know what I mean? Like you don't yeah. see that you're not relating to your body. You don't see that you're moving differently. You don't see that you're breathing differently. You're clenching, you're holding. Mm -hmm. You just, you don't realize it because it's just the way you are as a result of the pain. Oh, that's so true. And I, and I think one of the key things about what you just said is that the experience of pain often disconnects us from awareness of, of ourself. Mm -hmm. uh, even so much so that we know now from the science side that um, sometimes when pain, there's ongoing pain, that uh, a person will have uh, a hard time actually feeling the non-pain sensations of their physical body. So, you know, imagine a person with low back pain and, and we ask them to take their attention to their low back and, and tell us what they feel there. And typically what a person would do is tell us about their back pain. Mm -hmm. And then, then, of course, I always get a really a sort of funny reaction to people when I say, okay, you told me about your pain. What I want you to do is take your attention back there and tell me the non-pain sensations you can feel in your low back, mm. which, which a lot of people, you know, really don't get that. And I say, okay, well, you know, just right now, take your attention to the feeling of your hands. Your hands are resting. Can you feel your fingers? Can you feel the temperature of your skin and your hands? Can you feel the, the angle of the knuckles? You probably can feel a whole lot of non-pain mm -hmm. sensations there. And say, and if you had low back pain, I'd probably say, okay, now take your attention to your upper back or your mid-back and notice the non-pain sensations there. Just sort of explore and scan around. Okay, now what I want you to do is go down to your low back, notice the pain, sort of acknowledge it. Now what I'd like you to do is see if you can feel non-pain sensations in that same area. So maybe you need to try to look under the pain or around it or through it mm -hmm. to feel that. And it's amazing that some people will say, you know, I really don't experience anything right now except the pain. All I feel mm -hmm. there is pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I can feel my mid back, I can feel my upper back, but my low back, it's pain, that's all there is. And then other people will say, I can sort of feel it, but it feels like it's murky or muddy or hard to feel. And um, then, you know, we don't often get it with low back pain, but say it was your hand where the pain was. Well, often people, when they start to do this, say, you know, my hand doesn't feel this right shape or size. It feels like it's too big or it feels like it's too mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's distorted. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting is that the practices of yoga specifically get people to take their attention to their physical self to try to reconnect to those sensations. Um, and this is always, you know, the part of yoga, but uh, in Western science, we're finally understanding this. It's really only been the last five or 10 years where we've paid attention to the distortions of body awareness and body image that are common when pain persists. Yep. And, and of course, this becomes really fascinating to me because the next part is, um, as a research guy, I get stuck in. Because I know clinically when a person tells me that, that when I get the person to start to work on finding those subtle non-pain sensations of their physical body, 
that when the person starts to, to be able to feel those sensations, that there's an associated decrease in their pain. And then the more the person is able to feel the subtle non-pain sensations of self, the more, the more the pain diminishes. But I can't give you any good scientific explanation for that. Um, you know, we, we, we see it clinically, but we mm-hmm. can't fully explain it in some sort of, you know, central nervous system or insular cortex or any of those things. We, we just can't explain it. But it's, it's, to me, that's part of the interesting thing about, about, about the practice of yoga is that it's driven by experience. Uh, yet what the science is now doing is showing is that there's science that says that, you know, the experiences of yoga aren't just all in your head. They're actually real measurable changes in mm-hmm. the, the human's biology and physiology. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. And I, I wonder, now you have me wondering, well, why, why do people experience that decrease of pain when they start you know, looking at the painful areas more than just painful. I mean, Mm -hmm. are they, are they making changes in the sensory cortex? Is it affecting that idea of smudging that maybe they have a clearer outline of what that body part is now in the brain and that can Mm -hmm. lead to changes? I don't know. Yeah. But, but it's really an interesting concept. Well, the, the added thing about that too is that, as we start to study interoception more, right? Mm-hmm. Our, our sense of our physiological state, we start to realize that um, body awareness, an aspect of it is, or a big aspect of it is happening uh, sort of outside the, the, the sensory cortex. It's, it's happening more in the, insula, in the insular cortex. And so in, I know in the last year, I saw one research study that was saying that they couldn't find any smudging in people who had altered body awareness, but they were looking at, the, the sensory motor cortices and didn't look at the insular cortex. And so it, it's another area as the research goes on is maybe that smudging uh, is happening in a different place or that, that alteration of brain activity is happening in a different place than we thought. Mm. But certainly the person is experiencing it. And if the person is experiencing it, we hope we can be able to find, you know, the, the, the correlate in the brain activity. Mm-hmm. Of course, our, our, you know, our science is far beyond or far behind uh, the experience that the human has, which really gets back to that other aspect of what you're saying is uh, that that statement is when we study uh, physiology, we hope that by studying physiology and, and pain physiology, that what we start to do is understand the human more <clears throat> rather than um, well, maybe I'll say it this way. Often when I go to pain society conferences, there's a lot of biochemistry people there mm-hmm. and they're talking about the research. And at the end of it, they nearly always say, so what this science says is that here's this target for pain care, for pain intervention. And what they're talking about is that uh, we could give a chemical to the person to target this thing, this gene or this ion channel or whatever it is to change the person's experience of pain. And of course, my question always when I'm there is, so is there anything that the human could do to change that? Mm-hmm. Outside Rather, of something pharmacological. Well, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and it would make sense if, if we're getting good effects from different treatments like yoga therapy, that obviously they must be affecting these same biochemical and genetic and epigenetic things within the human. Um, but they're, they're doing them through the person's own, you know, we could say through their own medicine cabinet. Mm-hmm. Right. That medicine cabinet in the brain that David Butler talks about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can expand it into the human, right? Because there's mm-hmm. a, um, you know, especially even with endorphins, because there seem to be receptors for those all over the, the body. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Or even, you know, up and coming research into the microbiome and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think is also an interesting, uh, interesting study in pain and how can it can we alter our diets or can we alter what we put in our system to change the pain experience? Oh, absolutely! And I think this this you know when we get to nutrition, the book actually has a chapter on on nutrition mm-hmm. and. Um, one of the things that we find once again clinically is that 
some people change their diet a lot and really have very little change in their pain or their quality of life. Other people change their diet even just a small amount and get a massive change. Mm-hmm. And, and this, once again, is part of the thing that, that uh, is the complexity of pain care is that uh, we, you know, as an organism, we are a whole bunch of systems together. And uh, sometimes you can change one system a little bit and it really, really changes the organism or the, yep. the, the person. And other times you change that system a ton and you get very, very little change in the human. Um, and that's, once again, part of the, the trouble of pain care, but part of the advantage of approaches like yoga therapy is because they're, they're sort of okay with that idea, is that everyone's fully individual and we don't have a, uh, everyone should change their diet this way or everyone should move their back this way or everyone should you know, stand this way, or, right? right? It's not, a, it's not a, a, a linear model at all. Yeah, no, definitely not. And then when you when you think about pain and you think about it as an experience, and if we're going off of all the different inputs that can be put into the body that can have impact over one's pain experience, and you think of all the different ways you can alter those inputs, all of a sudden treating the person with persistent pain goes way beyond just movement. Oh, exactly. It, right? Yeah. It, goes, it goes into all of those myriad of inputs that you have the ability to alter, whether that be as the yoga therapist, the physical therapist, or let's not forget the person experiencing the pain themselves. Oh, it's so true. Yeah, and, and, and with that last comment you made, the, the person experiencing pain, the one thing we're really happy that we did within this book was that that's, that's our first chapter. So Gilletta Belton mm-hmm. uh, uh, wrote the first chapter on the lived experience of pain because we wanted to bring it back to, you know, this is why we're doing this work. Um, it's not, you know, it's not that we're all just trying to understand pain. We're trying to help people. Um, but back to movement, one of the things I, I, I think is that physical therapists and yoga therapists, um, anyone who's doing movement therapy, I think one of the really important things that we can do is start to um, shift our view of movement as that we can use movement for more than helping a person to be flexible, helping the person to be stronger. Um, and within, uh, within yoga therapy, we often do this. We'll, we'll say, you know, when you're in this yoga posture, um, it does, it's not just affecting you on the physical level, it's affecting you on every level. Um, and so we can actually use some of the yoga postures uh, to help with other issues related to pain. Such so, as? Such as. So I was thinking about, so... Um, a, uh, when, when we do a seated forward bend, so mm-hmm. maybe if you have back pain, it's really hard to do it, but you still could get in that kind of position where you're sitting on the floor, legs are in a straight or bent in front of you, and you're trying to reach down towards your knees or shins or feet, wherever you get to. Um, the, uh, the metaphor here is of learning how to uh, let go so you can move forward. And so... Um, we can use a lot of the different yoga postures like that is that we're thinking, so here's, here's a person who's stuck, right? The person is, um, uh, you know, maybe it's letting go of the need to have a definitive diagnosis Mm. because a lot of times that happens. And sometimes to be able to, we see the person clinically that, you know, when we're in this multidisciplinary pain management setting, we say, you know, it seems to be this one of the big things that's stuck for this person. They're, they're stuck believing that they need that to be able to move forward. And so we can use movement or postures to try to address other issues like that. Or as maybe another one that makes it a little bit more, is more clear. Um, often we feel a sense of fragility when yes. we have, uh, especially low back pain, pelvic yes. pain. Yes. So if we could get you to come into one of the standing warrior postures, when people, the majority of people in a warrior posture Um, standing with your arms reaching up or out to the sides, there is a sense of strength and stability and connectedness when you do this. And the really nice thing is we could do those postures from a seated position and people still feel that same kind of thing. And so the idea is, could we use movement to affect the person on a psycho-emotional level as well? Could we make that out one of our goals? Is this person doesn't feel strong, feels uh, unstable, feels fragile, could we use movement not just to create physical strength, but to address the other changes that are happening in the person? I think so. 
Yeah, I, th- I think so too. And I, yeah. I, love that, I love that yoga's got that part. And, and I hope that other movement practitioners start to think, well, you don't need yoga to do that, right? You can use any, you know, think of any movement that we do and how it makes us feel. Could we address it that way? And then the one other thing about movement that I try to address in one of the chapters in the book is the idea of using movement um, or yoga therapy as an educational agent. Mm -hmm. So so I know your listeners all know about Explain Pain and that wonderful work there. And what we're doing with Explain Pain really is a, uh, it starts with a a cognitive behavioral therapy, right? We're changing Mm -hmm. cognitions to change their behavior. And so for a lot of the people that we work with, um, they may not have learned how to learn by sitting and listening or reading a book. They may have learned how to learn by doing. And so one of the things we're playing around with is the idea of when a person has ongoing pain, could we get the person to move in a way that could, so that when the person moves that way, they feel uh, an increased sense of ease or they get some increased movement. And then you use that change from the movement as the educational agent. Mm, saying so, like, look at what your body can do. Yeah. Say, kind look, of a thing. Yeah. Well, you could start with, wow, that's awesome. Your pain changed. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that's one of the, one of the core uh, messages of explain pain is that right. pain is changeable. So instead of telling the person the pain is changeable and explaining it to them, if you could get the person to do something and at the end of it, they, have less pain or more ease of movement to say, look, it changed. And of course the next step is, and you did it. And mm-hmm. so I would then jump into, let's look for all the other things that you could do to actually change this, which is saying to the person, pain, your pain is changeable and you have some influence in it, which is part of what we're trying to do with right. explain pain. Yep. Yeah. It's like giving them the keys to the car. Exactly. Right. And, and having them, be in the driver's seat versus feeling like they're the passenger and the pain is in the driver's seat. Oh, yeah. That's a really great way of saying it. And, and I think clinically what we want to do is both with people. Mm-hmm. Right? I yeah. think what we, 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 you know, we want to find a way to integrate these things. But I really, really believe that there's a lot of the people we work with would understand pain better if we got them to experience it, experience what we're trying to tell them right yeah and and we know experiential learning for a lot of people is something that sticks exactly yeah and and i think that's the the thing is that for there are a whole bunch of people that when we explain pain it changes their cognition but it immediately they get it they understand it it uh it's powerful enough to change their behavior but then there's other people, and some of the research shows this now, is that some people have this sort of partial reconceptualization of pain. Mm-hmm. They understand everything you told them, but they don't apply it to themselves. And so what you're going to need to do at that point is get the person to have the physical experience that uh, matches up with the cognitive experience. Yeah. And, yeah. and I guess what I'm saying is that what we could do is use the movement practices of yoga or any kind of movement practice uh, for some individuals as the educational agent first. And, we, and I think we need to start to play with that uh, because some people just don't learn well when we talk to them, at least not as well as they do with the physical experience of it. Yeah, and I think as the therapist that you can kind of get a sense of this after one or two visits that okay, it seems like they understood, but yet they're not able to apply this to themselves. Or they kind of come back to you with the same, I don't want to say the same complaints because that's not right, but with the, with the same maybe problem-solving outlook that they did before when you know you've kind of spoken about pain and and maybe how how pain works let's say from from explain pain and they're mm-hmm. still coming back to you with the same ideas right the same oh, i did this so i must have done something wrong and that's why it hurts because i keep doing this to myself exactly right and, you know, there's there was something in what you said too that made me think that it's possible that that person coming back um doesn't have 
the coping strategies that match up with the new information that they learn. Mm -hmm. So the person's, you know, coped by being, say, being tough and just sucking up and gritting their teeth and pushing through it or coped by fear avoidance. And so we give them this new information, but we, the person that hasn't, uh, when the pain worsens, they go back to the coping strategies that don't match up with the new paradigm. Right. Uh, yeah, And that was really hard for me to do as well. So what would happen, and I'll give an example of, of what that means. I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I used to get a lot of neck pain in my sleep. So I'd wake up and kind of feel a pop and then wouldn't be able to move. And what my original coping strategy was, was, hi, I have to call off work today because I need to stay in bed. Mm -hmm. so I would stay in bed. I would use ice. I would use heat, and, but I wouldn't move. And that did not do well for me because <laughs> like it would help in the short term, maybe that day. And then I'd be able to get back into things the next day, but I was still in an awful lot of pain. I mean, maybe I was a nine out of 10 and then I was a seven out of 10, but the seven out of 10, I could function. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Until I started going through explain pain and, and moving more. So now if I wake up and I feel that pain, my first thought is not, oh, I better lay in bed. It's, okay, let me get up. Let me start stretching. Let me start moving. Let me go to the mm -hmm. gym and at least get on a bike. And now, because that's sort of my, my new shift in thinking, that maybe the pain will last only one or two days and not forever. <laughs> you know? yeah. Because before, yeah. it was this high level of pain with a higher spike. And now it's just little to no pain with a spike or a flare up, if you will, a couple times a year. But knowing the moment I feel that, that I get my butt to the gym and I realize that movement is the thing that helps and mm -hmm. that I shouldn't be fearful of that. Right. So for me, that was the input into my system that helped. And everyone is different, of course, but I think that's a, a real life example of, of what you just said. Yeah, and I think it's a great one because what you've said is that what you've found is that you can change the pain and the ease of movement through movement. Mm -hmm. But also I think what you're saying as well is by uh, there's somehow there's a different relationship with it or a different perspective on it. You're yeah. understanding it in a different way. Yeah. It's less as this sort of monstrous threat mm -hmm. <laughs> that's going to take over my life for the next couple of weeks days, months, versus now it's like a little annoyance that I know I have the coping skills and the mechanisms at my disposal that I can make a change for myself Right. versus going to a doctor for a quick fix of a pain medication or something, which is what I used to do. Yeah. Well, and what I'd say as well as within, within yoga and yoga therapy is that uh, yoga therapy will offer you more uh, an expanding uh, number of coping strategies or alternatives. You know, we often think of yoga as making people more flexible in their body, but it actually makes us more flexible in how we adapt or, or modify things when pain persists. So, mm -hmm. you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, maybe one of the things is that um, laying there and actually taking your attention to the pain and exploring the pain, actually spending some time doing that or uh, the practice of noticing what's happening to your breath so, uh, or changing your breath or noticing what's happening in your body tension or changing your body tension. So within yoga, there's many, many different ways that you can try to impact things. We often say we, we want to do practices that have to do with awareness because awareness practices in and of themselves can be uh, beneficial when we have ongoing pain. Mm -hmm. And then there are other practices that are about regulation. So, you know, getting you to breathe in a certain way or hold your body in a certain way or move your body in a certain way or think a certain way. Um, so with the awareness, you could have awareness of your breath or your body or your thoughts or your emotions or your energy or the pain. And the same thing with regulation. You could regulate any of those and start to see what happens when you do either of these things. Um, but then the one other bit you said too is, was about discernment is what, what you've learned. You've, you know, you've changed your view of you. You're, you're now, when you feel the pain, you can discern more about 
uh, when the pain is like this, I need to do this. And when mm-hmm. the pain is like this, I need to do this. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's another uh, positive that people can get out of the practices of yoga therapy is that you start to actually uh, understand your pain better, right? Be able to um, discern different aspects of it or different strategies that you need to do at different times where often when we have chronic pain, it's almost like we lose coping, right? It's oh, like, there's no question. You lose everything. You lose all perspective on yourself as a human being. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, even as someone like me, who is, I was a physical therapist when my, I first had all of this pain and you just completely, everything I learned as a PT flew out my brain. <laughs> it was gone. Oh, absolutely. Um, because all you want is for the pain not to be there. And the reason you want the pain not to be there is because you want to have a life with more choices and more possibilities. Whereas when people are in pain, their choices are you get up, you go to work and you come home. Mm -hmm. If you can even make it to work, those are your choices. That's all you have. You know, if you have kids, maybe it's struggle to take care of your kids or suffer through taking care of X, Y, Z, right? Versus when you don't have pain, your options are I can get up, I can go to the gym, then I can go to work, or I can go to work, go to the gym, meet up with friends, go on vacation, you know, clean my apartment, uh, go play sports. Do, so all of a sudden, you have a life of very little choice and possibilities to an opening of your choices and possibilities. And it's just because you don't have that pain anymore. Right. And, and I think that's one of the, the beauties of the practices that allow us to start to explore um, are there things that we actually can do for ourselves to try to change this? Or are there things that people can help guide us to be able to do that? Because I, th- I think when we're in that huge pain, uh, what we're looking for is, you know, the, the thing that will just stop it. Of course. And, and, and you know, we're living in society where the, the approach mostly is to look externally. Um, and then one of the troubles that, that people have sometimes when they start to hear about yoga therapy and, and sort of the self care part is is just this idea that it's almost like it's all up to me, right? Mm-hmm. You're telling me it's all up to me, and what we want to say is no, that that's that that doesn't really work well. What we want to do is say what you need is the expertise of a PT or a yoga therapist or an OT who can help to guide you and be there and and you know cheerlead you and coach you and help you through this because this is really really hard stuff. Yeah, like, le- you know, learning the the techniques of of yoga. For if people really immerse themselves in it, they'll typically say, this is hard to do. Mm-hmm. Well, it's way harder to do when you're in pain, right? Because right. the, the, the pain's demanding. And you don't want to think like, oh, I have one more thing I need to do. Now I need right. to do this. I've exactly. got all this pain. Now I need to do this. Yeah. Yeah, true. But yeah, but- when you position yourself as the guide, you know, I've been reading this book by Don- Donald Miller called The Story Brand. And in it, he talks about... Um, the guide Mm -hmm. who would be in this case, the yoga therapist, the physical therapist and thinking of them as like the Yoda and the student or the hero, he calls them the hero of the story, which would be our patients would be the heroes of our stories or like the Luke Skywalkers. So they're coming to you for guidance. You're helping them. You're giving them the tools, the confidence, in this case, the movement, the education that they need to go out and be the hero of their lives. So it's not like, oh, one more thing I have to do. If we can reframe that for those people in pain, it's more like, let us guide you so that you have so much to do. Uh, absolutely. And you know, there's one other piece that I just want to tack on the end, because I'm sure you have some people here, you know, listening who, who have ongoing pain mm-hmm. is that one of the really difficult things. And I know some, there's been some blogs talking about this recently that I think is important is when we work with an individual who has ongoing pain, we actually don't know what the outcome is going to be. Nope. Um, I think we can be pretty certain that we can help people to be able to move with more ease and to have some less pain and to, you know, get quality of life. But somehow we need to say, say to people that, you know, when you do these things, you might be the person who says, you know, the pain's mostly gone and I really can do most of what I could do before. 
Or you might be the person who says, well, you know, the pain's better, but it's still there. But what you've been able to do is show me how to get back to a lot of my life. You know, the pain's mm-hmm. less, but I've been able to get back. And then there's this other group that will say, you know, it doesn't seem like the pain really has changed at all. But, you know, if we've been successful with them, the person will say that, you know, even though the pain is there, you've helped me figure out how to live and have pain. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and I think that's that's one of the struggles that, that people have when they hear us talking about pain management um, is this uh, the struggle between, you know, looking for wanting so much the thing that will stop all the pain, um, but then rec- the, not really recognize or maybe recognizing the ideas that for some people that's not the outcome. Right. Yeah, and I try and, you know, and that comes – I think as the therapist, I think that comes, that's something that I think experience helps a lot. Yeah. The experience of the therapist helps a lot because you kind of have a little more confidence to say to the patient, hey, listen, the goal here is to get you doing the things you want to be doing. You may still have pain doing them, but you can do everything Mm -hmm. you need to do. Would you be okay if you had a small amount of pain and we're still able to do everything you want to do? Right. Because our goal here is not complete elimination of pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I guess that is the ultimate goal, but being realistic, we have to tell the patient, Hey, listen, this may not happen. What if I told you you could do everything you wanted to do and the pain might be there. It doesn't really, you're not suffering doesn't bother you that much would you be okay with that right and that's a hard conversation to have yeah well you know in, in the yoga world it's it's somewhat easier because anyone who's a yoga therapist has i mean that's what we've learned that's really what you know yoga says is that uh, we will have pain we will have suffering in life and the whole practice of yoga and yoga therapy is to actually learn how to live with it and decrease it yeah and i think that that's important it's important to tell patients and that's the one thing that this is a total rant on my part so i apologize (laughs) ahead of time but you know when you see websites and they're like eliminate your back pain by reading this free resource right well that drives me bananas (laughs) and it drives me crazy as a person who did have chronic pain for many years because you're searching for that thing. And if someone puts that out there and then you read it and you're like, my pain is the same, I would be like, well, screw you. It didn't oh. help my pain. It's like a crappy thing to do to someone because I feel like you're preying on very vulnerable people by doing that. And well, I think that's why it annoys me. Yeah, I agree all the way. I mean, it's just, it's just not truth. It's a right. marketing shtick. And right. Um, right. I'm, I'm, I'm like you, it, it enrages me. Um, yes <laughs> it's it's a it's hard not to be the police though right you want to jump on and say what are you saying and and we know that you know within our our professions uh really within all the the, the healing professions or helping professions there are people who who unfortunately use language like that and hopefully some at some point we will be more compassionate with our language yes, yes i hope so because oh man that is something that just drives me crazy. But I digress. Let's get back to the book. Uh, what other, before we wrap things up here, let's get back to the book. What for you, um, what do you hope people take away from the book after reading it? Well, I guess the, the biggest thing that I want people to take away with is this idea that yoga therapy is something we should consider as. Uh, one of the paths when people have ongoing pain. Really, overall, that's what I want people to do. Um, you know, we don't think that yoga therapy is the answer, um, but we see it as something that can be integrated within our Western medical uh, work with people with chronic pain. And uh, so integrated into that system, but also it allows um, more access because it, it people usually can get to yoga therapy for less of a cost than they could mm-hmm. to medical practitioners. So, it's more just to see it as, as you know, we've got, as we've talked about, there's this view of what yoga is. Well, yoga is something different from that. And it, it actually uh, does make sense as, as one path to consider uh, when we're, we're working towards uh, recovery when pain persists. Absolutely. 
And now before we end, I have one more question for you. And that's knowing where you are now in your life and in your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> oh, wow. You know, uh, my first, after I graduated as a physical therapist, I, I uh, spent the first uh, four and a half years working in a, uh, in hospitals and worked in mm -hmm. um, trauma ICU and I worked in a neonatal ICU and cardiac care and all these things. And, um, I think the, the, the thing, if I were to go back to that spot, I would say, hey, you're doing the right thing. Um, it's funny because a lot of my colleagues were working, you know, were stepping right into private practices. Mm -hmm. um, and by being in that situation, uh, what I, not only did I start working as a physical therapist with this umbrella of protection, because there are all these other people who are also working with the same patients in the hospital, um, but I learned such a humanistic view of, of what I was doing. Um, I, and I guess that's because a lot of the stuff we were doing in the hospital had to do with life and death uh, when you're working in a trauma ICU sure, and, uh, sure. and with, with neonates. And, and so I think I, you know, cause I know when I was, was doing it, um, I, there was a lot of pressure to, to, uh, cause I, I wanted to work in, you know, sports medicine and in, uh, in private practice. Um, but uh, I was, there was pressure not to be in the hospital. So I guess I would go back and say, you're doing the right thing. Because it really helped me to see the, to see the person more than the, the low back or the shoulder or the knee. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So now where, peop where can people find the book? Uh, well, the book's on Amazon. Awesome. So that's probably the easiest place to, uh, to find it. Yes, so, and you'll share it. You'll give me a link. So we'll put the link in the show notes. So if people want to go okay. to podcast.healthywealthysmart.com, they can just click on this episode and go straight to the book. Great. And if people want to uh, learn anything more about the other things that I work on. Yes, so they, where can just, they find um, you? My website is paincareu, like a university you, just paincareu.com. But I'll share that as well with you. Perfect. And on there, you can learn about the pain care yoga uh, training that I do. And I have a, a, a distance professional mentorship that I do for healthcare professionals as well. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. And because you're up in Canada, right? I say, oh. I am. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. I'm, uh, if you were in Vancouver and you drove east about four and a half hours over a couple of mountain ranges, I'm in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia. Got it. Got yeah. it. Canada is so big. Um, well, Neil, thank you so much for coming on. This was a great conversation. I think it's going to give people a lot to think about when they're working with those patients in pain. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Karen. It's, it's been a pleasure. And everyone, thanks so much for listening. Have a great couple of days and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. Thank you for listening. And please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media.